What if architectural educators actively worked against the common tendency to subdivide architectural knowledge into the pedagogical silos of design studio, history theory seminars, and technical lecture courses? What if the seminar classroom, for instance, was reimagined as a space for theoretical discourse, historical inquiry, and design speculation? What if the act of making was understood as a mode of research? Today I'm going to talk about a seminar that I've taught a few times now called Ground Forms. And in addition to the content of the course, I'm going to talk about its structure, which aims to integrate historiographic and design-based methodologies through a series of modeling workshops. Ground has become a central topic within design discourse over the past few decades. We saw this with the emergence of movements like landscape urbanism and landform building, which called for a hybridization of architecture, landscape, and urban design. But actually, our focus in the ground form seminar was to resist or challenge this smoothing over of disciplinary boundaries. So instead of continuous ground surfaces that blur divisions between architecture and the city, the seminar proposes five discrete typologies of ground that operate at an explicitly architectural scale. These are slabs, negatives, piles, rocks, and platforms. And these five typologies correspond to the five modeling workshops that occur throughout the course. This is a three-hour seminar that meets once a week. So basically, we have a lecture and a reading discussion on a particular typology one week, and then do a modeling workshop on that same typology the following week. All of the models that I'm going to show you were made during class time because I wanted the students to be using their time outside of class to read and write about the thematic associations of each typology. So in this way, the course prompts students to use design and making as a primary means for engaging with theoretical and historical themes associated with the ground. Hopefully that provides a sense of the structure of the course. I want to go through these five ground form typologies and show some of the student examples from the workshops. But first, I think it will be useful to provide a brief overview of the discourse on ground that the seminar introduces to students. Ground is one of those terms within architectural discourse that seems so familiar that we rarely see a need to offer a definition at all. Yet the more one tries to characterize ground in specific language, the more slippery the term becomes. In fact, ground might be better understood as an overarching category that includes a diverse range of terms some of which overlap, while others clearly conflict. Such a list of ground terms might include concepts that relate to scientific modes of analysis, like geology, or terms that point to the material composition of ground, like soil and dirt, or its physical form, like terrain, mound, valley, or topography. Meanwhile, other terms have social or cultural connotations, like homeland or park. Then there are terms that engage the economic considerations of ground, like property and real estate. Some terms frame ground through the lens of aesthetics, like landscape and vista, while others draw ground into the complicated realm of geopolitics, like territory and frontier. Then, of course, there are ground terms that are explicitly architectural, such as terrace, floor, or foundation. Indeed, the more we try to pin down any singular definition of ground, the more it shifts and multiplies in meanings. One useful exercise that I do with students in the ground form seminar is a mapping of these various ground terms. So we use a dictionary to look up the definition of each term and then try to find overlaps or conflicts to organize them as a set. Here you see a few examples of our initial mapping exercises. And you can see how particular groupings start to emerge. A certain number of words, for instance, might fall under the category of politics or agriculture. We then try to refine and synthesize these mappings into a more legible format, which you can see here. The slippages amongst these various terminologies are always operating in the background when one considers the relationship between building and ground, which is one of the most significant dynamics within the discipline of architecture. Throughout most of human history, the ground was understood as a stable foundation, both literally and conceptually, for architects to build upon. During the early 20th century, however, modern architects invented new formal typologies that challenged this foundational status of ground, 
while some leveraged innovations in steel and reinforced concrete to physically disengage their buildings from the earth, others deconstructed the architectural object in an effort to extend their interior spaces into the surrounding landscape. Architects of the post-war era explored even more radical approaches to ground, ranging from speculations on nomadic buildings to the complete dissolution of architecture into field conditions. The integration of digital modeling software into architectural practices during the 1990s further propelled this collective reinvention of ground, especially through formal experimentation with continuous surfaces that blurred the traditional division between architecture and landscape. Among the projects that exemplify this trend are Toyo Ito's Grin Grin Park, Renzo Piano's Volcano Buono, and the Yokohama International Port Terminal in Yokohama, Japan, designed by foreign office architects. In these projects, ground undulates and folds, becoming benches, walls, and even ceiling planes. Loosely grouped under the movements of landscape urbanism and landform building, proponents of these building ground hybrids contend that the blurring of boundaries between architecture, landscape, and urbanism would reinvigorate urban spaces with smooth flows and network connections. Yet despite the successful translation of landform buildings' theoretical positioning into realized works, which is no small feat, by the way, Many architects, especially those of the emerging generation, are beginning to question whether such blurring and hybridization has dulled architecture's understanding of its specific role and agency within contemporary culture. As a critical response, there is a clear preference for the discrete as opposed to the continuous within many circles of contemporary design practice. This preference for the discrete over the continuous is summed up in this diagram produced by Tom Wiscom. So on top, you see a drawing where architecture equals landscape. And according to Wiscom, this fusion undermines objecthood, so that gets a sad face. Then below the dashed line, he offers three potential strategies for relating to the ground, which are hovering, ground object, and squished in a hole. And you can see examples of these three ideas within Wiscom's body of work. Recognizing these recent shifts within architectural design and discourse, my ground form seminar highlights emerging typologies of ground that are figural and discrete, rather than topological and continuous. And as I'll discuss later, we also consider the ways in which digital tools have influenced architectural conceptions of ground. Among the novel approaches to ground that we cover in the seminar are slabs developed from draping commands and photogrammetry, negatives carved with Boolean operations, piles created through physics simulations, rocks wrapped with image texture maps, and platforms constructed from surface extrusions. In contrast to the topological complexity of fields, networks, and folds, which prevailed during the first digital turn, these emerging ground form typologies are often intentionally simplistic. Yet the overt simplicity of these ground forms should not be interpreted as a rejection of digital tools, but instead as a critical response to digital virtuosity as an end in itself. Closer consideration of the modeling commands and virtual environments used to generate these typologies, not to mention the social media algorithms used to disseminate them, proves that they are fundamentally shaped by the logics of digital tools. I've actually taught the course a few different ways. In the earlier version, the workshops were all done with physical models. So here you see us in our working space developing the ground form models. And it's a great collective experience to be physically engaged with modeling and to pass the bottle of glue back and forth. Here you see how those physical models become useful as artifacts to reference when we're back in our seminar room. However, with the COVID-19 pandemic and the shift to remote learning, these workshops were restructured around digital modeling. But I actually think this shift to the digital workshop format greatly improved the course because it allowed us to reflect on the way in which digital tools are reshaping disciplinary conceptions of ground. As Mario Carpo has pointed out, digital tools are no longer the tools for making. They are primarily tools for thinking. So in this sense, it is entirely appropriate for a history theory seminar to be engaging with digital tools in such a direct and intensive manner. And Carpo's larger point underscores my pedagogical belief that we must disrupt the clean boundaries within curricular structures that tell students to design in the studio environment and think theoretically or historically in the seminar environment. Hopefully these workshops I'm about to show demonstrate one way of blurring those presumed divisions. So if we begin with the slab, you can see here a number of references that we were looking at. 
from Le Corbusier's iconic rendering of the Maison Domino and its invention of a slab off-grade, to OMA's unbuilt Jeju Library project, which transforms the slab into a volumetric surface that shapes a spatial experience, to more recent projects like sports and the Ragdale Ring installation, or the Kid Gets Out of the Picture installation by the LADG. And in particular, this LADG project served as a source of inspiration for our slab workshop. One of the things that we were interested in is this idea that the slab might take on material properties, as opposed to the immaterial thinness of the virtual continuous surface projects that proliferated during the 1990s and early 2000s. Instead, the slab featured in LADG's installation appears to have no inherent form at all. It's not a ruled surface. Rather, it acquires its form from the scaffolding and clumps of materials that it's draped over. And this inclination to integrate the properties of matter and of physics into the virtual realm is something that we can see throughout a number of contemporary practices, from LADG to David Eskenazi to Team and so on. This group of designers seems to push back against the smoothness of parametricism and of digital virtuosity, allowing their forms to curl or bunch up even within the virtual realm of a digital model. Our slab workshop explored this approach through photogrammetry. Using a program called Trinio, we scanned a bunch of washcloths and napkins draped over various objects and then imported those models into Rhino 3D to edit them, apply materiality, and add various other elements. And in many ways, these student models that you're seeing here are somewhat derivative of the LADG project I showed before. But that's not really the point. I'm not necessarily suggesting that the workshops are intended to output great or original works of design. After all, the students only have a few hours during class to develop and complete each one. Instead, the pedagogical statement I hope to make here is that these modeling workshops support the activity of learning and engagement with theoretical issues. So by producing a model of this kind themselves, the students really begin to understand the difference between the smooth, continuous virtual surfaces of early digital projects and the more material slabs that are emerging within experimental design practices today. Our exploration of negatives highlighted subterranean excavations of various scales, from the domestic conversation pits that became popular in the 1960s and 1970s, to Peter Eisenman's conceptual investigations around the metaphysics of presence, to more recent subtractive projects like Nema Studio's Museum of Lost Volumes, which frames the void through notions of resource extraction. Our negatives workshop focused on the ubiquitous modeling command of the Boolean difference. Here you see examples of the student models created in the workshop. And while the instructions for these workshops need to be fairly prescriptive in order to make it possible for the students to complete the model within the time frame of a single class session, I also explicitly describe the conceptual mindset that the workshop is intended to engage. For instance, with the negative workshop, the instructions encourage students to develop and refine their models with careful attention to the designed relationship between solid and void, presence and absence, positive and negative. And you can see how these dynamics manifest in the resulting models. On its face, the pile might seem like the strangest of the five typologies I've selected in this seminar. Whereas Semper's invocation of the mound and its four elements of architecture conjures a sense of stability and foundation, the pile does the exact opposite. After all, piles are fragile, temporary constructions. This being the case, one would not expect architects to embrace the pile as a salient formal typology. Yet a number of emerging practices have nonetheless turned to the pile as a central reference point for their work. And so our theoretical investigation of the pile traced its lineage from the mounds at the center of Allison and Peter Smithson's Robin Hood Gardens housing project to sculptural works by Felix Gonzalez Torres to more recent manifestations of the pile in projects by Team, as well as Formless Finder, whose 2013 Design Miami Pavilion entitled Tent Pile uses a pile of white sand as a counterweight for the cantilevered roof. But perhaps even more curious than these physical variations on the pile is the fact that many contemporary design practices have begun to create virtual piles, developing their own software apps that do little more than pile things up into digital heaps. Among the examples of this trend are Moss's software number four, Sand, First Office's Blocks of Blah Blah, and Office CA's Malavik web app.
while some of these applications of digital tools border on the absurd, they nonetheless point to a larger conceptual project underway within contemporary design practice, one that aims to integrate the laws of physics and properties of matter into the virtual realm, challenging previous notions of digital craft and its emphasis on the aesthetics of emergence. At the same time, this sensibility also departs from both the violent collisions of deconstructivist architecture and the unified complexity of parametricism. Instead, these simulated piles celebrate the casual, the relaxed, the nonchalant, the haphazard, even the lazy. Moreover, the simulated pile accounts for both the existence of gravity and a defined ground plane in ways that early digital work did not consider. To have a pile, there must be a force pulling individual elements in a downward direction, and there must be a surface where those elements accumulate on top of one another. Thus, the pile offers an alternative to the binary positions of Semper's foundational ground on the one hand and the ungroundedness of early digital experiments on the other. To engage with these concepts in our pile workshop, we used an open source software platform called Blender, which is fairly common within the workflows of many contemporary designers. Through the rigid body constraints, Blender allows you to simulate physics, including forces like gravity, wind, magnetism, and so on. So the students began by developing a series of standard geometries from cubes to cones to cylinders, and then starting an animation in which these geometries fall in virtual space and collide with the defined collision plane. In this sense, the design of a pile becomes an exercise in curation, as one can adjust the size and mass of each object, and you can even amplify the force of gravity beyond its standard 9.8 meters per second acceleration. For most of the students, this workshop was the first time that they had ever used this particular piece of software and the first time they had ever produced a physics simulation. So on a pedagogical level, it was an incredibly valuable experience for them to directly engage with the tools that are being used by many emerging design practices. Without this kind of immediate experience, it would be difficult to fully understand and participate in the theoretical discussions that are occurring around these forms of experimentation. The module on rocks emphasized two different approaches, which Ellie Abrams actually identified in an essay published in the Possible Mediums book, namely the distinction between designing with rocks versus designing rocks themselves. So examples of this first approach of designing with rocks might include Albert Frey's Frey House 2, which is organized around this massive boulder in the desert of Palm Springs, or Studio Mumbai's Copper House. But the second approach of designing rocks themselves has been taken up more recently by a number of contemporary practices, including Team, and in particular Adam Fure, or Smilyan Radic, whose 2014 Serpentine Pavilion takes the form of a smooth stone juxtaposed against a dozen or so actual rocks beneath. In some of these contemporary rocks, the form itself is what pushes back against our expectations of geometry through techniques like photogrammetry. In other cases, such as this series of beanbag rocks designed by Moss, the focus is on the playful use of rock imagery as texture maps. Our workshop embraced this latter idea of the texture map, using a series of scanned rocks as our source material. The students began by exaggerating the contrast of these scans so that they could be interpreted through Adobe Illustrator's live paint feature as vector profiles. Importing these vectors then into Rhino, the students created compositions that combine multiple rock shapes and additional structural elements. The final step involves the application and rescaling of the original rock scans as texture maps onto the model. The seminar's final module on platforms provides the opportunity to reflect on the larger implications of architectural ground conditions. Through examples of classical podiums and modernist plinths, we discuss the ways in which various ground strategies can demarcate the division between architecture and the city, and by extension, the division between public and private space. Within contemporary practice, a number of designers have created platforms that treat the ground as an exercise in figural composition, such as this project by Bryony e. Roberts. Our platform workshop takes a similar approach, overlaying multiple compositions and then synthesizing them together through the extrusion of shapes with careful attention to the alignment or the misalignment of edges. In all of these ground form workshops, scale figures are inserted into the composition last. In this sense, the scale of the ground form is delayed until the last possible moment. Yet as one places a scale figure and adjusts the overall sizing accordingly, a number of possibilities arise, 
Through the integration of the human body, the ground form takes on notions of inhabitation, where these levels can now be imagined as seats, or steps, or stages. In structuring a history theory seminar around a series of modeling workshops, my intention was to leverage the specific skill sets of design students and to provide a more active learning experience. At the same time, this approach is also valuable for my own research productivity, as the students often created typological variations that I had not anticipated and which ultimately sparked new revelations within my own understanding of these ground forms. Thus, by disrupting the expectations of what can happen in a seminar context, this pedagogical cross-pollination of design on the one hand and history theory on the other ultimately fosters a symbiotic relationship between teaching and research that is valuable for the students and the instructor alike. Thank you.